What's up, guys? Welcome back. Today, we are going to be talking about the most common mistake beginners make when investing. I myself got only a couple years in investing, so I can remember my mistakes and Kirby choking me. So <laughs> I'm sure Kirby can remember his. But uh, what would you say is um, the most common mistake that uh, maybe you see with other people or the majority of people trying to start out in investing? Um. The one thing that I see is everybody, when they first start off, they think it's like a lottery ticket. I got a lot. I got a lot. So we might be here for a minute, but that's the first one. They think it's like a lottery ticket. They, you know, they'll reach out to you. Hey, I got a hundred dollars sitting around. Uh, where can I put a hundred dollars at? And they thinking that the hundred dollars is going to take them to a million, a million dollars. And they think it's going to take them to a million dollars in a month, you know? You know, people reach out and say, hey, uh, what can I invest in that's going to make me, uh, they talk about on the stock market. Um, what can I invest in uh, right now? I could put $500 in and I'll make, you know, $3,000 in two weeks. Because they think that it's just like a quick flip, like it's a drug deal, like it's they play in the lottery or something like that. And that's what they think investing is. They don't know, understand investing is over a long time horizon, you know, they confuse the flip game with long term game and they want to play both sides of it and think that they call themselves quote unquote investors. But just starting off, that's that's one of them that I see that a lot of beginning investors make. And that's a big mistake because usually they get into the, like the meme stocks or they get into something that's flashy or everybody's talking about on social media. They jump in there and don't realize they being sold. They being sold what everybody else is thrown out. And then usually they lose the money and then they swore off investing forever. Oh man, it's just a gamble. It's all that. That's where you hear all that verbiage from, from people that don't know no better and think that investing is more, is, is something different than what it actually is. Yeah, I agree. Um, and it all ties into like emotions. And I, I would kind of argue maybe that that emotion of greed or, excitement because sometimes you see these people they you know they get a hit you know they get into a meme stock it goes up 200 percent. they make a couple dollars then they're bragging they're blowing their money and stuff and they think that's the life of a trader or that's the life of an investor and so they get consumed with this like flashy lifestyle um for a te very short temporary time um but i would argue that that's more of a problem than those that get fearful because you see these people that they make quick money for a split second and they get they automatically develop a bad habit of thinking that's how this works and then they can never grow because they're constantly blowing their money or showing off in the wrong way rather than just sticking to a plan sticking to the game i think the most common uh mistake is that they are greedy which i think ties into what you were saying um in the sense that you know like you said you see them want to flip their money you know 5x or whatever with just a couple dollars and most people i hear they only want to start with like you said like $500 or 100 bucks or $200 like it's never like they're committed to spend or committed to invest more than that and when you tell them how much is actually needed to produce like a valid income like 50 grand 75 grand that at that level is when you can start to see like an, an income coming in from it then they don't even want to start so i think that's the most dangerous part of it is being greedy in the sense that you think that it's so easy to just flip shares on the stock market and then when you hear the reality, then you're, you know, you're deferred from even wanting to invest. So you never even start. And if you would have just started and just stuck with it on a long term basis, then you would have seen results. But because you never started, because you were too greedy to begin with, you you just lost out. Yeah. And then um, I got a million on the stock market, but I'm going to try to take it to every avenue. Um, the greed factor that you said, you put that eloquently i'm not going to deep dive into that but you're 100 correct on you know the greed the greed factor there um i'm gonna go to real estate the one of the biggest factors i see 
new investors that's trying to invest in real estate, no matter if they flippers or hold, buying real estate, you know, buy and hold real estate investors when they first start off, they don't know the numbers. They're dependent on real estate agents to give them the numbers. They don't know how to break down the numbers to figure out their ROI. They don't figure, they don't know the numbers to figure out the cap rate. I was talking to a gentleman maybe two weeks ago. He bought a property on the MLS. He paid over asking price in Florida in a high end area. And he called himself a real estate investor, uh, buy and hold real estate investor. And then, so I asked him, I said, did you know the numbers? Oh no, I was just dependent on this real estate agent. They gave me all the numbers. And then, so I sat down with him. I said, let's break down the numbers. And then, so I asked him, do he know what numbers to look at? He said, no. And I said, so you depended on somebody else to tell you what's, what's a good deal. And I said, that's your first mistake there. But that's a lot of people's mistake. They depend on other people to tell them. If, if you're dependent or you want to be mentored by somebody on any type of investing, if they're not telling you the numbers, how they derive to it, or make sure you understand the numbers because you're the one that's taking the risk, not them, especially from a real estate agent, then you're in trouble. So after we broke down the numbers, uh, he was cash flow negative about $800 a month. And I have, you know, quite a few properties here in Florida. And then I, you know, did great deals at the time when I bought them. And even with the number, with the insurance and stuff today, I have to do, you know, go through the rigmarole of raising rent and making sure I'm operating optimally. So those properties still cash flow at an optimal level, but somebody buying off the MLS above asking price with these uh, breakneck interest, I mean, insurance rates and then property taxes and stuff like that and maintenance costs and property management fees. I already knew it didn't cash flow as soon as he told me about it. But then we went over the numbers. Uh, he was about $800 cash flow negative each month. But he jumped into the deal not knowing the numbers, not knowing how to get to the numbers himself and depending on other people to tell him the numbers. And I think that's a very bad deal and omen for real estate investors and stock investors and business investors. But I'll get to my business investor side, uh, other issue I see. But Alex, what you got? Yeah, with the real estate side, I think it's a little bit different. Um, maybe it can tie into like emotional behavior with you know the same beginners on that you see on the stock market. But a lot of the beginner mistakes that um, I see or I hear about with real estate investors is they have the wrong information. And like you said, they don't know the numbers. They don't know how to actually look at a deal or evaluate a deal. And they just get into a wrong deal. Um, I think it's more of an issue of like lacking knowledge and lacking, um, I guess, literacy in that space. Whereas compared to like those in the stock market, they're just greedy and full of like excitement and fear and stuff. You know, it's like a different world almost. But in the real estate space, I think because it's such a bigger project than just buying your first share, um, you see people just get the wrong information and then they jump into a bad deal. Right. And then so the beginning mistake I see in the business realm, when people start businesses or they even buy a business, most people start their own business. The beginning mistake I see a lot of people make, and that's why 85 percent of small businesses fail within three years, is they start a business day one. Day one, they start the business and then they think the next move is to quit the W2 job. I think that's a big mistake because. You know, people think, oh, I started a business and most people don't have businesses. Most people just self-employed, but they want to quit their W-2 job the first day because, you know, I want to be my own boss. I want to control my own schedule. And then they start siphoning money, trying to siphon money off, off the top on their first revenue that they get from the new business. And then so instead of using that money that they're getting or the revenue that they're getting from the business to reinvest in the business to grow the business, they're living off of it. And then eventually the living expenses because they got the title of a business owner. They think they got to live life. Life creep happens to them. They always outspend the revenue that the company's making. And when they outspend the revenue, of course, they outspend the profits and things like that. And businesses fail. I mean, I, I behoove to people that starting businesses, you keep your W-2 job and you start the business, you keep doing both jobs. Everybody just think, you know, everybody want to be their own boss so they can work on their own time frame. People, when you start a business, you work way more than you do at a W2 job. When, you, when you're when you running a business, 
it takes years before you can get optimal to create your own schedule until you put the procedures and processes in places to so you can be hands off and you can hire the people in the right positions to make the business run if you're there or not. So this whole concept of, oh, I own a business and I'm a business owner or I own a job or I'm self-employed. No, that just means you got two jobs. You got the W2 job that's going to help you fund and create, get this business bigger because you're going to use all the revenue from the business that's, you know, over the normal operating expenses, you know, the fixed cost. You go, And then you're going to use that to invest, to keep growing the business bigger. And then once the revenue four or five, you know, 10x what you need for the business then you can step away from your W-2 job and then be 100% immersed in the business. But that's why a lot of small businesses fail because people start them and then they just think that, oh, so I started the business. So now I could just live off the revenue that's coming in. And then they have tax issues. They have revenue shortfalls. They don't have the right credit lines to even keep the business going. And then they don't know the numbers. Again, you notice everyone, stocks, real estate, business, Beginners don't know the numbers. They just quickly jump in so they can say, hey, look at me, I'm doing this. But in the reality is you're doing nothing. But the reason why is because you don't even know the numbers that makes every aspect of each investment work. Yeah, for the business one, um, you explained it really well. I was going to mention that as well. But I would add on to it in a different aspect in you know businesses that are already established but they're still small businesses the biggest thing i see with several small businesses is they're too afraid to expand and they're too afraid to allocate money where necessary to expand their business whether it's hiring a manager hiring employees they want to do all the work themselves and they're trying to grow this business into like a multi multi-million dollar business but it just is missing that extra help that they're afraid to hire for because they think that that person's not going to run the company the way that they want it to be ran. Um, which I think is just trial and error of, you know, that's just growing pains of a business. No, you know, you have to know what kind of employees you're looking for and just go through those steps. But I see that a lot where they just don't want to put the money where necessary to expand their business. Right. And I agree with you. Like I said, I talked to many people in many realms and you know I, I met uh one couple that you know they've grown their fleet out big and i said so you're still self-employed and they said no i own a business i said so who handles the day-to-day -day operations oh i do who handles the management of this i do who handles you know making sure the fleet is up and running and all that i do i said no you own a job i'm like you know you own a business when you have the ability to not work and the business still runs so right now you're self-employed. So, and then I went to the aspect of, well, you need to start looking to keep growing your fleet, of course, but hiring people in those positions so you could be more hands-off. And then, like you said, the first thing they say is, oh, you can't trust nobody out here. No, you can, but you got to pay them a wage that will make them do the job. You know, everybody start a business, oh, well, they, they should only get $10 an hour. They only should get like $8 an hour. But you want to run a business. And then, so then the next thing that happened, you get sick, then the business drop because you didn't put the proper thing, proper processes and procedures in place to make sure the business run without you. That's the only my only mode of operandi. And when I buy a business, of course, when I first start off, I'm going to be in there. I want to know everything from what the janitor do to what the business owner do all the way through. I want to know inside and out. But then after that. I want, once I understand the processes of each level of the business, I want to hire people to be in those positions because at the end of the day, I just want to be able to get on conference calls with the manager, with the GM, with the GM and be like, Hey, let's make sure we got this handled. Make sure we got that handled. And then, you know, a top down approach. I don't want to be, I don't want to be guy opening the keys to the, you know, got the keys to open the store, mopping the floor. Uh, you know, sitting here monitoring the cameras like I'm security, making sure. No, I want to hire people in all those places to make sure the business is running optimally. And then if they can't, you know, meet the mustard, then they got to go. Because once you doing, if you're doing all those jobs, you can't get back to what you said. You can't focus on expanding because you're down there in the, in the mud with them. So your whole time frame is focused on running that small operation. You can't even think of the big picture 
of, hey, how can I expand this out? And that's one of the big issues with beginning investors. They want to do everything and then call themselves a business owner when all when all the true a couple sick days from for you, then the whole business is going to crap. Absolutely. With all that being said, guys, if you liked the video, hit the like button. Leave us any comment you got down below. Share, like, subscribe, and we'll see you guys on the next one.